Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I'm delighted uh, today to welcome you to the 2018 series of lectures on the great books. I was just saying to Mark and Will and, and Dan, uh, this is the funnest part of my job, uh, talking about the great books. And uh, so I'm very pleased uh, to initiate our 2018 great book series with some meditations on the great writer Plutarch. Uh, but before I do so, I, I want to frame just for everyone's uh, edification uh, what constitutes a great book. There have been literally millions of books written and very few are known as great. Uh, just like there's very been hundreds if not thousands of leaders over time and very very few are called great so what really constitutes a great book a great book in my view has three fundamental characteristics among others the first characteristic is it's a book that endures over time and across cultures. It's a book that addresses anybody, literally anywhere. Because number two, it deals with noble themes. It deals with, with issues and complexities and contradictions that go to the very heart of what it means to be human. If you think of the Iliad, for example, which I'll be referring to uh, in the course of this lecture because it was Alexander the Great's favorite book. It deals with the wrath of Achilles. It deals with one small segment of the whole Trojan War. It deals with the wrath of a warrior in battle. It deals with jealousy revenge, betrayal, tragedy, illumination. These are issues that people have dealt with all over the world. And so a great book has a capacity to penetrate literally to the heart of our humanity and tease out issues that may not be easily resolved, but compel us to ponder the challenges that they deliver. And number three, a great book changes lives. Now that's very important to note <laughs> because when you're dealing with a great book, you're dealing with an intelligence not your own. It's not just words on a paper, it's an intelligence. You know, Mark is just coming up with a, a new book. And that book is going to carry Mark's intelligence. Will just uh, wrote a book, Walking with Bears, which I'm reading. Extraordinary book. When you read those words, you're interacting with Will Tegel's intelligence. And to the degree to which Mark or Will, or in this case, Plutarch, penetrates to the heart of our existential humanity. And you have any receptivity to what you're reading. Your life is changed. Your world is transformed. Just think of how many people have been transformed by reading the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita, or the Bible, or the Analects. These are books that have shaped entire civilizations. These are books that have caused enormous shifts in the historical process. So great books are very important. Uh, and in the ethos of our wisdom school, which as you know is iconically 
depicted as an archer pulling back a bow. The farther back you can pull that bow, the truer your arrow will fly and the farther it will fly. So when we deal with, deal with the great books, particularly the deep books from deep antiquity, we're pulling back our bow and we're letting fly the singular question, what constitutes our humanity? So it's within that context that I want to turn to Plutarch, uh, who has been one of my favorite authors since I was um, a teenager. Uh, he was a Greek, lived pretty close to the Oracle of Delphi. He lived between about 46 AD and uh, 120 AD, which means he was born shortly after the, uh, the death of uh, Christ. Uh, uh, and during the missionary uh, uh, adventures of St. Paul, uh, he would have been there during uh, St. Paul's uh, journeys into Greece. Uh, he studied at Plato's Academy and so studied philosophy. Uh, he lived very close, within 11 miles of the Oracle of Delphi and which was the greatest of the oracles of ancient Greece and one of the greatest of the entire ancient Mediterranean world. And for the last 30 years of his life, uh, he was a priest uh, for the oracle. And because he was philosophical, and because he loved to write, uh, he began to write biographies. And he's one of the first uh, individuals that we know uh, uh, actually began to write biographies. Uh, Herodotus, a couple centuries before him, wrote the first history. Uh, and uh, uh, Themistocles, uh, you know, wrote the great chronicle of the Peloponne uh, Peloponnesian War. And Plutarch applied his creative intelligence to writing parallel lives of the great Greeks and Romans. And the two of the greatest lives that he wrote uh, were Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Uh, and so I've chosen those two uh, great personages of history uh, to uh, talk about today. Uh, and I want to do that within the context of what Plutarch says in his opening chapter um, on Alexander. He says, he's not writing these biographies as simple narrative history. For the truth of great battles and brilliant exploits often tell us nothing of the virtues or vices of the men who perform them. Well, on the other hand, a chance remark or a joke may reveal far more of a man's character than the mere feat of winning battles in which thousands fall, or the marshalling of great armies, or laying siege to cities. So as we journey into Plutarch today, I want to touch on some nuances of history and Alexander's character and the character of Darius III against which he fought. And I want to tie it all in to the current situation in which we find ourselves under the aegis of the tyranny of Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump is coming into the American polity in some ways very similar to, way, to the way in which Alexander took on the Persian Empire. Neither we today nor the Persians 2,500 years ago were prepared for the phenomenon of a strong man that broke and 
is breaking asunder the very institutions that we have come to believe were eternal. So the questions that I'm going to raise around Alexander today, I actually chose Plutarch. I chose Alexander and chose Julius Caesar because I want us to contemplate what constitutes a great human being in the historical process. Someone who seizes power by force of will and force of arms. In Trump's case, through a treasonous act of collusion with the Russians to subvert the Constitution and steal the election by manipulating the media and even the voting machines. And then breaking the institutions that under normal circumstances would put him in prison. And that's a question, if you think about it, within the context of Persia and Alexander the Great of Macedon, is the question of how does peace cope with war? And how do we answer the question, does history make the individual or does the individual make history? Normally we flow along and history makes the individual. And then all of a sudden an individual comes up and shapes history. So these are the issues that I wanna grapple with. So to understand Alexander the Great, you need to understand the Persians. And I'd like to just very quickly, because we don't have very much time, and I'm going to be talking uh, as quickly as I can, because uh, I uh, have immersed myself in Alexander for my entire life. He's been one of my heroes since I was a little boy. So I, I have studied him and read all the biographies. And um, uh, so um, I'll be talking in a very specific way uh, today out of the voluminous material that is available. But I want to start with Cyrus the Great, who emerged out of what is now Iran at the beginning of the um, sixth century, about 600 BC, and shaped what historians pretty universally consider one of the greatest, if not the greatest empires that was ever built. And he set a template that has not been followed often enough. Most empires are coercive, rapacious, and cruel. Cyrus the Great put in motion the Archimedean dynastic lineage that lasted all the way from you know the middle of the sixth century to about 333 bc an empire that lasted almost 300 years and it was an empire that was founded on a benevolent notion of how the conquering elites should treat the conquered people. It was Cyrus the Great, you'll recall, that allowed the Jews to return from Babylon to go back to Palestine. It was Cyrus the Great that articulated, according to the United Nations today, the first articulation of human rights, the very famous uh, Cyrus Cylinder from about 346 BC. Excuse me, 546 BC, right about the end of his reign. It was the first known artifact that we have that talks about human rights. Basically, the right of individuals to live as they please, to believe as they please, and to interact freely 
within the imperial system. That was the Persians. It was Cyrus the Great that instituted the first Pony Express. And the imperial, it was one of the biggest empires ever built through all of history, was the Persian Empire. All the way from India up into Russia, all the way to the gates of Europe and including Egypt. And you could travel back and forth. And in fact, if you uh, read the great book that Mark recommended, The Shape of Ancient Thought, one of the most extraordinary books I've read in, in many, many years, he talks about how the Pax Persia allowed the first global interaction between East and West. So the Persian Empire was an empire that was seeking to govern through peaceful tolerance. And because of that, toward the middle of the fourth century, they had a very long reign of Artaxerxes II. Reign for, it was the longest reigning monarch of the Persian Empire. Uh, but at the end of his reign, he met with tragedy. His eldest son uh, conspired against him and was executed. His second son then committed suicide. And his third son, in 359, took power. And I point this out, because very far away in Macedonia, the third son of the deceased king of Macedon, Alexander the First, the third son, Philip, took power. So you have the third son of very long living kings taking power. Philip of Macedon was only 23 years old. Artaxerxes III, like Philip, was a very strong king, ruled for about 20 years. And then his chief eunuch, in 336, poisoned him and poisoned his son. And a nobleman called Atashata, working with the eunuch, seized power. But through this series of events, the imperial system was weak. And Atashata, who took the name of Darius III, who was famous in the land for his courage and had exemplified his courage in one of the uh, wars to the north by being the champion of the Persians against the other uh, uh, forces and had defeated their champion in single combat. He had also run the Persian Postal Service. He was part of the Archimedes family, but he wasn't part of the royal family. So what he needed was time to consolidate his imperial rule. But in the same year that Darius took power, Alexander took the throne in Macedon. And so it was the juxtaposition of a very long lasting imperial tradition with a newly emerged highly militarized 
kingdom, that the drama of the life of Alexander the Great and Darius the Third and the fall of the Persian Empire was played out. Alexander was born in uh, 356. Philip of Macedon was a very energetic king. He had seven wives. Uh, Olympias uh, was uh, his fifth wife. By all accounts, she was an extraordinarily precocious, ambitious, intelligent woman. They had a passionate love affair by all accounts. And there were many omens around the birth of Alexander. Now what's important to, to note about Alexander uh, is that on his father's side, uh, he could trace his ancestry to Hercules. And on his mother's side, he could trace his ancestry to Achilles. So Alexander was born the son of a king. He was born to a woman who was ferociously ambitious, that even though she was the fifth wife and there were some sons before her, that her son Alexander would succeed Philip of Macedon. And it became very clear uh, very early that Alexander was an extraordinary, uh, precocious uh, young man. And I'd like to just read a couple passages from Plutarch, again, referencing not so much the deeds of Alexander, uh, but the uh, character of Alexander to show that uh, when a great individual emerges in history, the containers of the social structure are often unable to contain, in some ways, the genius of the individual in question. And that's true not only in society and politics, but also in science. You know, science was trundling along quite nicely, thank you, and then comes Einstein. And everything has changed. So how, how a discipline, how society deals with aberrant, exceptional behavior and individuals is uh, one of the most uh, interesting and I would say puzzling phenomena uh, in human society and over time in human culture and history. So I just want to read from, from Plutarch that even while he was a little boy, Alexander gave plenty of evidence of his powers of self-control. That was one of the most extraordinary things about Alexander, his extraordinary powers of self-control and concentration. In spite of his vehement and impulsive nature, he showed little interest in the pleasures of the senses and indulged in them only with great moderation. But his passionate desire for fame implanted in him a pride and a grandeur of vision which went far beyond his years. And yet it was by no means every kind of glory that he sought. And unlike his father, he did not seek it in every form of action. Philip, for example, was as proud of his powers of eloquence as any sophist and took care to have the victories won by his chariots at Olympia stamped upon his coins. But Alexander's attitude is made clear by his reply to some of his friends when they asked him whether he would be willing to compete at the Olympics. Since he was a very fine runner, 
Yes, he answered, if I have kings to run against me. And Plutarch tells the story, one of the earliest memories that people have of Alexander is when actually ambassadors of the king of Persia. This would be Artaxerxes the uh, III, who like Philip, his father, had come to the throne on the same year, the third son. Uh, he sent ambassadors to, to Philip of Macedon, and Philip was not there. He was out on some um, campaign. And they were so impressed with Alexander, who was then just a very small boy, maybe seven or eight years old, but he, he held court. He sat on the throne. Uh, he asked very intelligent questions. Uh, he was very uh, astute in the way he interacted with them. Uh, and they went away and apparently reported to uh, Artaxerxes III that Philip's celebrated astuteness was as nothing compared to the adventurous spirit and lofty ambitions of his son. And uh, his choice, said Plutarch, was a life of struggle, of war, and unrelenting ambition. And this is very important about Alexander. You think of Trump and his tweets, the vulgarity, the lack of elegance, the primitive, atavistic, almost barbarism of Trump. He's a man devoid of true ambition, except power and divisiveness. Alexander was motivated by fame and glory. And one of the few sayings that we have it, that we attribute to Alexander, his great line, it is a great thing, he said, to live with courage and to die leaving an everlasting fame. And this is very important in understanding the genius of Alexander, he wasn't motivated by money. He wasn't even motivated by power. He assumed it. He was motivated by glory. He wanted to be Achilles. He wanted to be Hercules. He wanted to fill history and go to the ends of the earth. Uh, and, um, uh, you probably have all heard of uh, when he was 13 years old, his, um, his encounter with Bucephalus, uh, the horse. And uh, uh, Plutarch is, is uh, as beautiful as he describes it. Uh, uh, the the uh, Thessalians were famous for their horses. And one day someone came with a particularly fine horse. Uh, called Bucephalus, and Philip, with his courtiers and the nobles, went down to the plain to look at this horse, and it was a very expensive horse, but nobody could get on it. Nobody could ride it. So Philip said, listen, this is not a controllable horse, and um, uh, Alexander, uh, then about 13 years old, was standing close by and remarked, what a horse they are losing, and all because they don't know how to handle them or dare not try. And uh, Philip kept quiet at first, but when he heard Alexander repeat these words several times and saw that he was very upset, he asked him, are you finding fault with your elders because you think you know more than they do? Do you think you can manage this horse when my finest horseman can't do it? And Alexander retorted, at least I could manage this one better. And Philip said, well, what if you can't? What will you pay if you can't manage Bucephalus? And Alexander says, I'll pay the price of the horse. And the whole company, including the king, burst out laughing. And Alexander said, I'm serious. 
So Philip said, okay. They agreed on the bet. And Alexander went out to Bucephalus and he had noted that he was afraid of the sun. So he began to talk very softly to the horse and turned him around so he wasn't facing the sun. Bucephalus immediately calmed down, no doubt because he was in the auric space of someone of supreme self-confidence. And Alexander jumped on his back and rode him to the other end of the plane and then rode back. And Philip said, as Alexander dismounted, as he kissed him, he said, my boy, you must find a kingdom big enough for your ambitions. Macedonia is too small for you. And then Philip made the best decision a father could ever make for his son. He chose Aristotle to be his tutor. So can you just imagine? This is what I loved about Alexander. Can you imagine being this precocious and the whole court recognizing it? And choosing probably the greatest teacher of the Western tradition, Aristotle, the pupil of Plato, to teach your son ethics and politics and science. And it was Aristotle that taught Alexander the Iliad. And he annotated the Iliad for Alexander. And Alexander took the Iliad and had it under his pillow every night till he died. And um, I want to just um, read one more thing just to give you a sense of, of what, what a great personage is. You know, when he was only 16 years old, says Plutarch, Philip left for one campaign or other down into Greece and, and in the court they, they had a little revolt of a tribe to the north of Macedonia. And without asking anybody, Alexander organized uh, some troops, went out on his own, captured the, the city, drove out its inhabitants, established a colony of Greeks, assembled from various regions, and renamed the city Alexandropolis. He then took part when he was 18 in one of the most crucial battles between Philip and the Greeks, who Philip was in the process of conquering. And it was Alexander that led the charge that brought the victory. So much so that the Macedonians began to speak of Alexander as their king and Philip as their general. And I want to just pause here and, and talk about the 2016 presidential campaign, because I'm choosing these stories for, for a reason. Remember when Trump started? He went against 16 candidates on the Republican side. Nobody thought he had a chance. And when all was said and done, he was the only one left standing. He demolished Fox News. He demolished the Republican Party. And has remolded it in his own image purely by the force of his personality. Think about that. We have a man in the White House that may destroy the Republic. And he emerged onto the world stage and took the presidency of the United States by force of personality. He had no real campaign. He didn't spend much on media. He controls the media even to the present day. 
we're dealing with a phenomenon here. That's what I'm trying to get us to see through these stories of Alexander. The Persians never had a chance because they were dealing with almost a mutation in history. When he was 20 years old, his father died. His father was assassinated. I don't have time to tell the story and I, I uh, can see by the clock that I'm taking too long already, but I, so I'll speed up. But I wanna um, uh, just now uh, talk about Alexander after he took the throne. His father was assassinated. Alexander took the throne. All of his advisors told him, you're too young. You got to be peaceful. You got to establish alliances. And Alexander said no. He immediately attacked, conquered, and got ready to do what he was born to do. And that is to invade Persia. Within two years, um, he had gotten ready to do what he was born to do. And it's around this that I want to uh, dwell now. Uh, right before leaving, he went to the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle was not working that day, it was not an auspicious day. Alexander didn't have time to wait another day. So he sees the priests and uh, the priestess. And she said to him, Alexander, you are completely invincible. He said, thank you. Let her go and moved on. He didn't have very much in terms of ships. He had almost no money. He started with 70,000 talents as, they are, as it's recorded by Plutarch. He was in debt at 200 talents. The 70,000 talents would last him about 30 days. While he was on the ships, he sailed straight to Troy. Uh, he gave away almost all his land. He gave away Macedonia. to his friends and his noblemen. And finally, one of them said, but Alexander, you're giving away everything that you're leaving. What's left for you? And one of the great replies of all of history, he says, what's left for me is my hope. And he landed at Ilium, went to Troy, went to the burial site of Achilles. And as was the custom, he ran a race naked with all his companions around the tomb. It was said that he was the first one to jump off the ship to land on the beaches near Troy. He was Achilles. And at Troy, he came into his full power. Meanwhile, Darius, hearing that the young 20-year-old, now 22-year-old boy, he was in his 40s, had invaded, ordered the satraps, the local regional commanders, to take care of this. And they had dealt with the Spartans who had come over and attacked one of the cities. They'd even dealt with the Philip of Macedon, who had sent over a, a, a foray and dispatched them quite quickly. And to give you a sense of the enormity of what Alexander was doing, just imagine if Guatemala, <laughs> let's imagine Guatemala decided to invade the United States and to take uh, its entry point, the great state of Texas. I wonder what Will and Mark and the Texans would think of a Guatemalan army coming across the Rio Grande. <laughs> Trump wouldn't bother. 
he'd call the governor of Texas and say, deal with these Guatemalans. They had no idea what they were dealing with. The satraps massed an army that outnumbered Alexander. It depends on the estimates, you know, four or five to one. They were at the Granicus River. They were on the east side, very high banks, swiftly moving river in between, and Alexander just came right off the plains of Troy to the Granicus. They were going to stop him as soon as he invaded. Parmenio, his uh, commander of his left flank, and all his generals said, Alexander, you need to think about this. They're outnumbering us four to one. And Alexander said, do you think I crossed the Hellespont to be stopped by a little stream? And here is really the genius of Alexander. No, and the reason why he's considered probably the greatest general in the history of the world. Alexander had an intuitive sense of the battle topography. The problem with the Persians is they were all lined up and Alexander could see what their strategy was. In every single battle he ever fought, and this is the reason why he never lost a battle. He's the only general probably in history that never lost a battle, starting when, when he was like, you know, 16 years old because he came into battle with disciplined troops, would maneuver and always attacked. And so there was no doubt in anybody's mind who controlled the battlefield. Alexander was always well marked. He had big plumes, white plumes in his helmet. Everybody in the whole battlefield knew where Alexander was. When the Battle of Granicus was over, tens of thousands of Persians were dead, and Alexander had lost only 34 men. So at this point, Darius realized that he had a problem. The Guatemalans had taken Texas, <laughs> and he had to deal with this and he had to deal with it himself. And, oh, I wish I could just relate some more stories, but it's uh, it, because there's a beautiful juxtaposition that Plutarch makes um, uh, between Alexander and Darius. And uh, uh, I'll just read just a little bit. But Alexander was moving around Syria, conquering, consolidating. Darius left Babylon, and uh, uh, Alexander was just supremely confident that he was born to take the Persian Empire. And there's a very famous story of, of, of Alexander becoming ill. He, was, he, he uh, uh, took a swim in a very cold river and got chills and, and spent the summer um, convalescing. One of the great what ifs of history, what if he had died? Uh, what if he hadn't convalesced sufficiently before Darius came to him? And his chief of staff, Parmenio, heard intelligence that Darius had bribed his personal physician that was treating him for his illness. And uh, Alexander read the letter from Parmenio and put it under his pillow without showing it to any of his friends. Then at the appointed hour, when Philip entered the room with the king's companions, carrying medicine in a cup, Alexander I love this. Alexander handed Philip the letter 
while he took the cup. And as Philip was reading the letter, that was indicating that he was gonna poison Alexander. Alexander drank the cup, looking Philip right in the eye and smiling. The king's serene and open smile clearly displayed his friendly feelings toward Philip and his trust in him. While Philip was filled with surprise and alarm at the accusation, at one moment lifting his hands to heaven and protesting his innocence before the gods, and the next falling to his knees in the bed and imploring Alexander to take courage and follow his advice. At first, the drug completely overpowered Alexander, and he fell into a swoon and displayed scarcely any sign or sense of life. However, Philip quickly restored him to consciousness and when he had regained strength, he showed himself to the Macedonians who would not be consoled until they had seen their king. And Plutarch juxtaposes this with uh, a little anecdote around Darius. There was at this very time in the army of Darius, a man named Amentas, a refugee of Macedonia who knew about Philip and knew about Alexander. And when he learned that Darius was eager to advance and attack Alexander as he marched through the mountain passes, which is what the plan was, he begged the Persian king to remain where he was on the flat because his army was so big and uh, cumbersome that if he got caught in the mountain passes, he wouldn't be able to deploy his, his um, uh, forces. And Darius said that he was afraid the enemy might run away before he would come to grips with them and Alexander might escape. And Amentus said, your majesty, you need have no fear on that score. Alexander will march against you. And indeed, he's probably on his way. But Darius refused to take this advice, but broke camp and advanced into Cilicia, while at the same time, Alexander marched against him into Syria. So as Alexander marched south along the coast of the Mediterranean, Darius followed him and actually caught up with Alexander saw his hospital where his wounded was, slaughtered everybody. That report came to Alexander and Alexander realized that he had Darius because Darius was now caught between the Mediterranean Sea and the mountains at another river called Issus, the great battle of Issus. And again, to make a long story very short, Darius did what his satraps had done put himself into formation. Alexander, riding ahead of his troops, seeing exactly what Darius planned to do, went into battle formation. And he would come into the battle in formation, doing maneuvers that would literally mesmerize the opposing forces. And then he would attack. And the battle was over according to most historians, in less than 45 minutes. Alexander's interest, infantry and his cavalry worked like a hammer and anvil. And Alexander always led the charge and always went directly to the king or the general on the other side. And Darius fled. The final series of images I want to draw out about Alexander is around his comportment in victory, and particularly his comportment around women, which I think is just interesting. Again, a juxtaposition of Trump. As I mentioned, 
Plutarch observes and all the biographers of Alexander, he was so committed to his glory and honor that after he'd won the victory, he became very generous with a few important exceptions. And in this case, after the Battle of Issus, Darius had fled. Alexander was doing the mop-up operations. Again, the, the, the Greeks slaughtered tens of thousands of the Persians and lost in the Issus only a couple hundred men. Darius had brought his mother, <laughs> his wives, and a couple of his children. And when the, the battle was over so quickly, and the dominance of Alexander so complete, the Persians just broke ranks and fled. So when Alexander shows up at the Persian camp, Darius's cooks had already prepared dinner. And he walked in to the tents of Darius and saw all the golden plates and goblets and all the wine. Um, and he said to his Phaestia and his, his, uh, his good friend, oh, this is what it means to be a king. And Hephaestion said, and now, Alexander, it's all yours. And they sat down at the banquet table of Darius and had his meal. During the meal, a report was brought to Alexander that the mother and the wife of, of Darius who was known to be an exceedingly beautiful woman, had been captured and were terrified in their tents. And Alexander gave an order, which was pretty unique, that they should not be touched. And, um, the wife and two unmarried daughters of Darius were among the prisoners. And at the sight of the Persian king's bow and chariot, which had been brought, they beat their breasts and cried out since they supposed that he must be dead. When, they heard, when he heard this, Alexander was silent for some time, for he evidently more, was more affected by the women's grief than by his own triumph. And uh, uh, he sent one of his aides to tell them that Darius was not dead and that they need have no fear of Alexander for he was fighting Darius for the empire of Asia, but they should be provided with everything they had been accustomed to regard as their due when Darius was king. And then Plutarch makes a point about Alexander that he thought it more worthy of a king to subdue his own passions than to conquer his enemies. So he never even came near these women, nor did he associate with any other before his marriage, with the only exception being a, a, um, a woman named Barsine before he met a, a Persian woman, Roxana, uh, in what is now. Uh, Armenia uh, and uh, northern Iran. Um, and um, uh, then the, uh, the final thing after the next battle of Galgamela, the greatest battle, because Darius ran away, assembled the biggest army in the history of the world until the time of Napoleon. I want people to think about this. Again, Guatemala attacking the United States. After the Battle of Issus, accounts were that he assembled upwards of a million troops. Just his cavalry was greater than Alexander's entire army. 
And this time Darius met him on the open plain, north of Babylon, because by this time Alexander had taken all of the Mediterranean down into Egypt, and now he came up the Tigris and then down the Euphrates River. And uh, Darius came uh, to a place called Galgamela and leveled the plain. And when Alexander's troops saw the vastness of this army, Parmenio, his generals said, Alexander, you, I mean, don't, you can't, don't even think about this. And at a minimum, attack at night. And Alexander said, no one is going to ever accuse Alexander of stealing his victory. And again, he did what Alexander always did. Went on his horse, got as close as he could to the Persians, and he sized, sized it all up. And then he went back and he offered a sacrifice to the God of fear. And they went into his tent, he's told his troops, have a good night's sleep. We're gonna fight in the morning. And he slept so soundly that when his generals came in to wake him up, he was still fast asleep. And so they gave orders for the entire Macedonian army that only numbered about 50,000 to start having breakfast. And then finally Parmenio came in and shook Alexander and woke him up and said, Alexander, how can you be asleep on a, night, on a morning like this? And it was said that Alexander yawned and said, Parmenio, the victory is already mine. And it is said that when Alexander came to address his troops, that an eagle circled overhead. And the eagle then flew directly at the Persians. And Alexander exhorted his troops. And then as he did every other time, the Macedonians attacked the Persians. And when it was all over, Darius had fled and the Macedonians conquered in one of the greatest battles actually in military history. It's still a puzzle today how Alexander with only 50,000 men could take on an army of a minimum of hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And he did it by essentially attacking Darius directly. <laughs> and um, then the rest, as they say, is history. Now, I've told this story to show the power of personality. that just a personality has power. And we're contending with that, with Donald Trump. I've told this story secondly, because one of the major reasons why the Persians never stood a chance is because they'd been at peace for so long, neither at Granicus or at Issus or at Galgamela were the Persian armies experienced in battle. And Alexander came with a small, committed, highly trained group of veterans who acted in complete unison 
and at the service of a, of a king that they considered to be a god. There was no other explanation for a phenomenon like Alexander the Great. And that's important because the United States, like Persia, has had institutions that have just endured. We think it just goes along because we're Americans and our institutions go along. And then you get someone like Trump who crushes one institution after another. And this is important because it's not so easy to deal with an aberrant phenomenon who, do, who, doesn't, who doesn't obey the rules. So this is something very timely for Americans and the world. Because the United States is, one of the, is the great power and we have a president who is a, has the mentality of a reptile and an arrogance of personality that doesn't obey any of the rules. But has a very dedicated following. The worse it gets about Trump, the more loyal the Republicans become. The more passionate his followers become. So whatever happens, he has that 35% of the vote that controls the Republican Party. How do you stand against that? This is not an inconsequential story that I'm telling you today. And even though the, the details are different and Alexander was great and he was as temperate in victory as he was uh, terrible in battle and, and if there's something that's happening now with Trump that we need to pay attention to. Because depending on whether we can articulate an institutional response, like the special prosecutor, will the special prosecutor be able to withstand Trump? Because he's going after the special prosecutor, and so are the Republicans. And we all know that. Let me just um, close with a final vignette about Alexander. He took his armies to the end of the world to the Ganges River, and then they mutinied. And he had to turn back. He'd been wounded, it is said, over eight times in the various battles. He was wounded in each of the battles at the Granicus, at the Issus, and at the Gaugamela. He turned back to Babylon, and as Plutarch records it, he lost his spirit. Omens started to appear that he interpreted as, basically, you're done. <laughs> you're done. And within 24 months, he was dead. Now that's an important point upon which to reflect. What is going to break Trump? What is going to seize, what is going to break his power? Remember the story of, of Samson. He could do anything until Delilah cut his hair. And then he had the strength of a mere mortal. And he died. Alexander, after going to the ends of the earth in his world, 
until his troops literally refused to follow him in battle. And he almost died, actually. Lost his connection with what had generated his greatness in the first place. The only way we're going to defeat Trump is to break his spirit. How will that happen? Will it happen? Think about it. Again, these great, these great works of history, the stories of Plutarch around Alexander and next month on Julius Caesar, are great because they're as current today as they were then and open up for us now as I've tried to do uh, with issues of deep importance, in this case, to the viability and integrity of our democratic republic. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, uh, open it up to uh, uh, questions. And what I'd like to do is um, uh, see who we've got, because um, I'd like um, different ones of uh, you to uh, comment. Uh, we want to start with some of our students. Uh, and um, so I'm just going to call on some of the students and see what you have to say. And uh, I see uh, Michelle Blair. I was just talking to Michelle last night. Thank you for joining us, Michelle. Um, uh, do you have any comment? And then I see Kate Chris. Well, good, Kate, you're here. I'd love to uh, uh, have Kate uh, uh, comment, and then we'll uh, go from there. Maybe Steve will comment. And then we're going to get Will before the, uh, uh, the, the hour, because he has to leave. But Michelle, what's your comment about our, our remarks today? Oh, a lot to think about, um, especially with the, the last comment that you made, Jim, about the, about the breaking of spirit of Trump, because in my mind, I've always thought um, the spirit was unbreakable. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so that's given me a lot to think about. Um, wow. Um, makes me want to know more of the stories and about antiquity and how they're still relevant today yeah i mean this is it's a i think you're 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 asking the right question you know how do we take trump out what's going to break him the and other question there's internal there's an internal process of these strong men that's at, mm. at it that according to plutarch is more important than the externals the other question that keeps rumbling in my mind is the concept of complicity and how we participate with this. Um, it makes me, in the New York Times, there was a piece on it. And since then, it's been, it, it kind of goes on to this, like it, it, as a citizen of not just the United States, but being a human, then how do we, how, are we complicit? And, and in what ways are we complicit with this? in conjunction with breaking Trump's spirit um, because we understand that we're either being constructive or destructive in our choices and our words. Absolutely. Where was everybody on the Women's March this last weekend? Where were we during the inauguration? How are we making our voices heard? We do know that he's very thin skinned. We do know he's very vain and he looks at numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank it's you. good to have you. It's great. You. And I loved our conversation last night. Thank you. I did too. I appreciate it. Thank you. So, Kate, what do you have to say about this, this, uh, these issues? Hi. Um, Hi, Kate. When you said that what's going to break Trump's spirit, I think he's already broken. I think that a lot of what drives his, him is that he has a broken spirit. And uh, I'm not, you know, I... He seems like, I mean, I don't know how he got so much power, but, you know, it, 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 you know, other than this whole thing about fame and glory and all of that, 
And it just brings up the question to me, what is greatness? Is this really greatness? You know, is Alexander really greatness from this way you're talking? It doesn't sound all that great to me. And where's the compassion in all this? Yeah, the term great, I mean, you're raising a very important point. I think that the, 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 um, the term greatness, uh, as I was using it, is just sort of extraordinary without reference to, to ethical application. Right. Um, you know, surely, you know, Jesus of Nazareth or Gandhi were, were also great, but they were in the first instance, extraordinary. Yeah. And, uh, um, uh, you know, so that's, that's, that's a very important, uh, issue. You know, we, we don't, we no longer need alpha males fighting wars that needs to be that 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 particular vocation on the part of males needs to be retired <laughs> yeah <laughs> brings up a lot of questions yeah thank you thank you will what is your comment I'm mute here uh you know <clears throat> i i think i will um say my comments i'd like to hear from uh, I, I was reading the chat as we went along and angie had a lot of comments and saw also amy so oh i haven't seen them yeah uh, angie amy please uh uh weigh in here there's angie hi angie hi how are hi, you angie. <laughs> what's your comment on all this um, my comment was um, between Alex and Trump. I think that maybe both of them were very um, hurt as little boys. So they're coming from stories of I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy. So they are constantly trying to prove that they're good enough or worthy or that they, um, you know, are, are great. <laughs> yeah. You know, what childhood traumas? Absolutely. <clears throat> you know, we have obviously more information. <clears throat> about Trump uh, than we do Alexander. Uh, the first biographies of Alexander weren't written for several hundred years after his death. So there was just oral traditions, sort of like the gospels uh, that uh, kind of were cultivated uh, and probably embellished over time. Um, but um, uh, with Trump, we have a lot more information, of course. Um, and we all have our wounds. It's a very important notion that greatness comes as also as a compensation for wounds almost like an overcompensation uh for wounds <clears throat> yeah and amy amy made the comment uh i won't speak for you amy but raised the issue of at the end of his life uh with post-traumatic stress disorder that uh, uh is important for us to note yeah I mean, just imagine spending, you know, your life from 16 to 32 at war mm -hmm. and uh, suffering grievous wounds <clears throat> all over his body. <clears throat> so just, just one brief comment. I have uh, uh, two episodes stand out to me in your very excellent uh, lecture, Jim. You always... Uh, uh, amazed me with uh, your detailed uh, knowledge of a specific uh, subject that we're covering. Uh, one, one was the story of the horse and the epistemology, Aristotelian and Platonic epistemology that Alexander was reflecting as was the whole situation in that the task of the human was to manage the horse. And uh, that's picked up later in the story of Alexander's going to the Oracle of Delphi, that very beautiful, incredible set of eco fields. Uh, and uh, Plutarch grew up 11 miles in the midst of that web. Uh, 11 miles, there is nothing. I mean, he was right in the midst of the Oracle. And Alexander's uh, intent was to, go and not get information or wisdom or guidance, but rather permission yes. to do what he wanted to do. 
It was he was clear what he wanted him to say. <laughs> clear what he wanted him to say, and, and so you have this patriarchal epistemology of control, management, and and separation from the field. But it emerges from time to time, like with the eagle on the battlefield, uh, and then at, toward the end of his life. Uh, uh, in his beginning to read omens and so on, maybe he's coming back to a deeper form of himself. I don't know. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you're reminding me, you know, that one of the omens by which he knew he was done was um, crows mm. uh, eating flesh mm. outside the walls of, of Babylon and uh, he took that as an omen. He was deeply religious, Alexander. He always sacrificed to the gods every day. He took omens um, that were overwhelmingly positive. But then after um, the great battle of the Ganges um, and, and uh, the return to Babylon, the omens became increasingly uh, a negative. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so, um, well, thank you. I see Banafshe uh, is uh, with us. Banafshe, you're a Persian. What's your, do you have a, a, a Persian perspective you want to share? <laughs> I tried my best. By the way, uh, Alexander paid the ultimate tribute to the Persians by adopting their imperial policy of tolerance. Um, and in that way, he was very critical of Aristotle, who was a Grecophile and a racist. <laughs> Alexander was very uh, egalitarian, and uh, wherever he went, he adopted the Persian policy of tolerance to local peoples. But uh, yeah. Banafshe, what's what is your comment on these matters? Well, Alexander doesn't have a very good reputation in my. <laughs> And it was actually very sad for me listening to how um, you were saying the Persians were peaceful people and this is why they fell. So that is, very, it's, it's tragic that that had to be the way uh, it went. But just to comment on what others are saying about Alexander, I mean, that he is obviously a hero and there's so much to learn from his character and for, from his way of being. Um, and we don't have to just focus on his warring nature, but other things that he can teach us in terms of who he was, as you were sharing with us. So, so it's both. Both. I, this is not somebody that I particularly like. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not someone who holds a high place in my culture. But there's a lot to learn from him. Definitely. So thank you so much. This has been a very informative lecture. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mark, do you have a comment? First of all, I, I was mesmerized. That was, that was just a brilliant presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I'd like to just uh, reflect a little bit on a more modern view of what constitutes leadership. Oh, uh, the, um, we, we, have this in Plutarch, we have the great man perspective of um, the what makes for the leader is the inherent virtues and character of the the person and uh, you've you've um, explained that beautifully but you know as as we get into the twentieth century, there tends to be a view of leadership emerging that links it a little more directly, I'd say, with the, um, uh, with the body politic and with the society. So that if you take a union view and look at a figure like Hitler, what made Hitler rise to power was not particularly virtues in, in the Alexandrian sense, but rather the way he embodied an emerging social archetype. Yeah. And in, in, in um, Plutarch, you see that operative in the sense that 
the social archetype at the time really honored conquest so that even the defeated would transfer their loyalties to the conqueror and they would treat the conqueror with great respect and con um, conquest itself was seen as a, a a great value that's what motivated alexander he wanted to be the conqueror and that's that would probably be somewhat different today we'd like to think we've gotten beyond much of it, it may be operative more than we like to think, but it's, um, it's not going to win the kind of widespread praise as you've heard. So I think this question, this perspective bears on uh, Michelle's uh, question about how are we complicit, and also on the omens that figure into Plutarch. But the notion would be, if you apply the union sense, and look at uh, Hitler as an example. Hitler was an extreme of some, some shadow element in the society that was bursting to the floor at the same time. And the, the, the inveterate support that you speak of that Trump has, I think says, something similar about the shadow side of, a, yeah. of American culture that's, that's brought him into prominence. Now, I tend to be uh, somebody who, who has studied those American institutions for quite a while and continues to have faith in them. And I, I do note that um, I'm, I'm forgetting the man's name. I think it's Lipstick or what, but there's a, a particular, Particular professor who's been um, in, in Washington, I think he's at American University, who's been noted for his um, predictions in American politics. And he was the only person of real credibility who predicted prior to the election that Trump would win. And he's now saying that Trump will be impeached within a year. So that is. That would speak to the power of the institutions. But yeah, yeah. You certainly made the case, and I think uh, very well, that it, it's an open question, and it's uh, the uh, the integrity of those institutions are are in the balance. But I do think it's helpful to to look at the um, to to take a gander at this uh, more modern perspective and look at what the causes that emerge that result in the emergence of a certain leader seeing that in the social psychology of the society that brings him to the fore yeah good thank you so much yeah absolutely you know and again does history make the individual or does the individual make history and uh, when someone like a hitler emerges as an expression of a shadow content of an archetypal form. You know, what does that really say about free will? And to Will's point, you know, to humanity's capacity to manage and whether uh, it's actually the other way around. Um, and to the, to the issues of, of, of that you're raising, Mark, you know, what really constitutes leadership? You know, one of the things we're trying to do at the Wisdom School, and Will has been at the forefront of this with his whole notion of the eco field and uh, eco spirituality, is uh, how, do, how do human beings, and I would say men um, in particular, in terms of this lecture around Alexander, how do men redefine what it means to be a warrior? If warriors are here to conquer, um, what do we conquer other than our own aggressive instincts for the, for the greater service of humankind and the eco field? And what kind of transformational process do, uh, to alpha males, um, you know, if Trump had been taught or to gone you know, met Will 25 years ago <laughs> and had some really good psychotherapy, <laughs> you know, maybe that energy could have changed and uh, something else would have happened. 
So I think you're making an extremely important point, Mark, that as others, our definition of the leader changes over time. And there is a critical need now to, uh, to, to really think through not only what leadership is, but in a time of the internet and democracy, how do each of us become the leader we were born to be? It, one, one final comment, Jim. I, it, was, it occurred to me that this is so relevant in your, uh, uh, that question in the story itself with Alexander's training by Aristotle. What was the role of Alexander's general education in his formation, and uh, how did that how did that come into play in the in the activities of history, and, and uh, what's the analogy? <laughs> of the yeah, yeah. <clears throat> absolutely, absolutely. Well, we're almost at the end of of the uh, the time. If there's unless there's another part of oh, Joy has her hand up. We'll do one more with Joy. Hi, Joy. Ooh, okay, real quickly. <laughs> I was uh, wondering about how many people who are on the call who have actually spent time um, asking questions, inquiry with people who support Trump. Um, it just reminds me of the saying that it wasn't just one person capable of evil, Hitler, but so many men and women of good will weren't capable of good. So in terms of um, what I am doing and being in is working with clients and asking the questions. So case in point, last Wednesday night, I had dinner with the CEO that I'm working with for 25 years, his wife. I maybe had dinner with her three times in 25 years. I'm, I'm helping their son with his career for free, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, the dinner went on for three hours and two and a half of the hours were based on talking about Trump and uh, she and her husband and family are a Republican and uh, talk about their Christianity quite freely. She told me how she uh, goes to ministry in Jamaica every year and how she goes to court with young poor people. And, and then she told me how Trump is amazing. And it, it was, I was just so intrigued. And we had a passionate back and forth throughout and her husband was quiet. <laughs> Jeff didn't speak a word. <laughs> But what was curious was with the point for point, very passionate and smiling and all, you know, upsetness and whatever, a couple, a Caucasian couple walks by and Jeff and his wife were Caucasian. Um, and uh, cause all of these mixes of diversities were I think were at play. He spoke to Alita and said to her, you had a lot of great points in that conversation. <laughs> so uh, I guess we were kind of loud, people heard us. And, um, and when he left, I said, so Alita, what do you think about that? Uh, do you think that he maybe supports Trump or why would he say what he said? And she said, I don't think he heard what you said. <laughs> now, those of you who know me, is that a possibility? <laughs> in a dialogue uh, at a restaurant that no one would have heard me, but they would have only heard her. So I posed a couple of questions and we promised to share what we're reading and what we're talking about and hugged when we were done. And I went, that was so great, the dialogue because the people who are voting to really know who they are, what they think and how they're thinking what they think, without judging it, I found really made for a great container for further inquiry. Yeah, thank you. That's a good note upon which to close our session. Um, you know, if you read the, the great book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, uh, you, you find exactly the situation that Joy just described. And Jung references this in his, his uh, various papers uh, and his definition of mass hysteria. He says is, is the paradox of mass hysteria is that you have perfectly ordinary people. They go to church. They love their children. They obey all the rules. And yet they're collectively engaging in something that can only be described as insane. My whole family, um, my sisters, are all ardent Trump supporters. They're, they're, they're evangelical Christians like this couple and this woman appears to be. 
um, you know, Trump moves the, recognizes the capital of Israel in Jerusalem and the evangelicals feel this is the answer to biblical prophecy. And Trump is an instrument of God. Right? And they're going to go down believing that. And that's part of this challenge that I'm, I'm wanting to tease out. That 35% that, that support Trump are like the people in my family and that Trump had dinner, uh, Joy had dinner with. They're good people, most of them. But they're supporting something that to any objective observer is a catastrophic disaster for the republic. And the man needs to be impeached. And uh, so this relationship between the leader and the led, the relationship between these archetypal patterns and social contracts and what gets transacted in history, this relationship between an empire at peace and a young man dedicated to war. Trump has built his power on war. He's at war with everybody he can think of most of the time. He's attacking, attacking, attacking. He's Alexander. He always attacks. And we don't know what to do about it. And we may lose our republic, like the Persians lost their empire. So I, I, I want to close by just asking people to think about Trump more deeply, about Alexander more deeply, about the one single point, what are you doing about it? Trump needs to be impeached, what are you doing about it? What is leadership? And how do we rise to that standard? So uh, I will thank you all. Uh, this has been a great discussion. I've talked about one of my favorite people <laughs> and, uh, and I hope I've made it relevant. I haven't, I haven't offered this as a pay on to Alexander the Great. I have tried to talk about Alexander the warrior in relationship to our contemporary crisis so that we really honor what Trump has done. It's not so easy to become president of the United States and the destructiveness with which he's now transacting the presidency. It's going to take us out and down if unchallenged and unstopped. So we're in the position of Darius. So uh, we'll talk about these things on Facebook and uh, we'll uh, try to send out the link. I think most of you have the link, uh, but this has been a rich, juicy discussion. And uh, so I thank you and bid you adieu uh, till next month when we'll take up the equally complex uh, uh, story of Julius Caesar. Bye everyone. <laughs>